Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of UMass Sports Weekly. I'm your host, Casey Johnson. Spectacular show lined up for you tonight. We're going to start it off with UMass basketball. Up and down week for the boys. Loss at Dayton, but good win at home against URI. We'll be sure to recap both of those games. We'll then follow that up with men's and women's lacrosse. Both of those teams, top 10 in the nation. A lot of good stuff to talk about there. Follow that up with Boston Sports Desk with our very own Tim Dennehy. And then we'll finish it up with the rest of UMass Athletics. This is UMass Sports Weekly. This is UMass Sports Weekly. Welcome to another episode of UMass Sports Weekly. Now joining me at the table to discuss UMass basketball, Chris Podomatis and Mark the Shark Daily. Guys, <laughs> welcome to the table. So as I mentioned in the intro, up and down week for the boys. Tough game at Dayton, but a really good win at home at the Mullins against URI, who likes to think their rivals are actually far below us. But uh, our very own producer, director, and showrunner extraordinaire, Tony Bolduke, was actually at the game and got us some pretty spectacular highlights, so let's take a look at those. Today we have a matchup between the UMass Amherst Minutemen and the URI Rams. Last time they played in Rhode Island, UMass came out on top 73-68. We'll see what happens tonight. UMass would struggle early, making only three of their first 23 shots. Max Yeshua makes the first bucket there for UMass on a nice layup. After that, Xavier Munford would take it to the, take it to the rack and make it 10-6 URI. UMass was struggling defending, defending the paint at the beginning of the game as Hasin Martin had back-to-back -back dunks to make it 12 to eight and then 14 to eight. As we see here, UMass is struggling as Xavier Munford puts a three-pointer in to make it 17 to eight. UMass would eventually respond with the three-pointers of their own from Samson Carter to make it 21 to, thir to 13. Trey Davis would also throw in a three to make it 22 to 16. So UMass started coming back with the three ball. UMass leader Chaz Williams drives to the lane here, and as we know, Chaz never gives up on any shot. After Trey Davis takes it into the lane, Chaz jumps over everyone else and tips it in. Chaz also has some range and drops back from three and nails it. Trey Davis was on fire for three this game, as he hits a three to make it 31-28. Hassan Martin would also make a nice drive and layup to make it 31-30 at half. Coach Kellogg must have been in his players' ears at halftime because they came out hot. As we see here, UMass has potential to put up big dunks and big plays as Derek Gordon throws an alley-oop to Raphael Putney. Putney really knows how to sky above the rim. So Derek Gordon throws another inbound pass right to Putney for the slam. This slam made it 36 to 30. Both teams used three pointers to get back into the game when they were down. As E.C. Matthews nails a three, and Xavier Mudford comes off the dribble and nails a three to cut down the deficit from UMass. Both teams are trading baskets towards the end of the game as Trey Davis makes it rain with a floater from the free throw line over the URI. The layup from Xavier Munford would tie the game up at 54 with just over six minutes to go. UMass would be too much for URI as Derek Gordon makes a nice layup to put the UMass Minutemen up by two with less than a minute to go. URI would have a chance to respond until Gilvitas Baruda turns the ball over with a travel. All it took now was Chaz Williams to knock down his free throws. These two free throws that Chaz hits Puts the UMass Minutemen up three. URI would have another chance to come back and hit a three to tie up the game, but they would not be able to get one off. They ended up following Trey Davis, who iced the game with his two free throws. Tony Bolduck here at the Mullen Center for Amherst Media. It was a close game for the UMass Minutemen tonight, but they came out on top 70-67 to against the URI Rams. It took timely defense and clutch free throw shooting from Trey Davis and Chaz Williams but they came out on top on a very close nail biter. Thank you very much, Tony. Looking very sharp there and great coverage, great stand up. We love it all, appreciate it. As he mentioned, good win for the boys, 70 to 67. Always good to see him at the Mall Center. Been really successful at home this year. Chris, I'll start with you. Why don't you give us a little, some keys to the game that you saw. I know Tony gave us a very thorough recap, not much to go over left, but why don't you give us some key points that you saw in this game? 
Uh, I think one key was that UMass out-rebounded URI 41-28. They were really able to control the boards, you know, limit the second chance opportunities that, that they had, and really just get up the floor and push the ball and get into transition basketball, which really which UMass is key. You know, they, they, they like to get out, run, catch the defense off guard. Uh, one thing that was surprising, though, was that UMass shot 38.6% from the field. URI shot, I believe, somewhere around 50 so it's pretty impressive that you win despite shooting under 40% when your defense wasn't really getting the job done. And uh, one key point, Chaz Williams was just being Chaz, 16 points, 6 assists, 2 rebounds. Derek Gordon, 9 points, 10 rebounds. And Trey Davis, uh, 13 points off the bench. So, you know, a couple guys really stepped up big. You know, it was a typical UMass URI game where it goes down, to, you know, until the late minutes of the second half. But UMass was able to pull it out. Get a you know get another good home win at, you know in the another A10 win and uh, basically just keep trying to get the resume better and better. Yeah, that three guard tandem for the UMass men's team has been extremely extremely successful this year. Yes, been really relied on kind of heavily, especially Chaz. But uh, it's you know it's good when you see them perform because everyone expects them to perform. Mm -hmm. So it's good to see and you know we even see it, we saw it in the Dayton loss as well as we get to. But it's 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 good to see them three performing all on the same day because that's really what they're going to need come to any time. Mark, how about you? What are some key points you saw? Well, one of the things that um, they were able to, they didn't give up um, URI in the URI game. We're only up one going into halftime. Played very, very, both teams played very, very poor first half games. Mm -hmm. um, I, they missed something like 17 layups, I believe it was, in the first half against URI, which is just absolutely unheard of. Um, for, and, but, I mean, URI, they missed a lot of open shots, too. So the fact that they were able to come back out and play a much better second half um, they were really to just get down to business. Um, I don't know if it was just the nerves of getting back into playing at the Mullen Center, um, what the deal was there. They did, uh, coming off um, off the VCU win, uh, they definitely didn't have as many people in the crowd. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that impacted it at all. Um, there wasn't as much attention to this game, or the fact that you're playing a team that is just not as good. Uh, maybe they weren't as focused, but they just they were lucky that um, and very fortunate that they came out of halftime in that URI game, and that's one of the biggest things that they didn't give up, even though they played a terrible mm -hmm. first half. That they came back and they played a lot better in the second half, um, and I think that was one of the keys. I mean, UMass has always been a second half team, mm -hmm. particularly this season, but to come back and not give up um, and just play a lot better in the second half, I think that's something that we are able to take take from the game and. Uh, hopefully, come playoffs and come tournament time, that that's something that uh, will be. A con if we have a terrible half, hopefully we don't. But they'll be a, they can rebound from that. Yeah, I mean, against URI, it seems like it's been really a reoccurring theme this whole year that they have just played down to URI's level. Yeah. B based on record, based on RPI, strength of schedule, any way you want to look at it, UMass is a far better team than this URI team. Yeah. Yeah. But every time they match up, it's a single-digit game. It's very, very close. They're not playing very good. And you hope it's something mental with URI yeah. because you, you can't play like that against quality teams no, if sure. they think they're the team that they, they think they are that yeah. is going to make a run in this tournament. But uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count it to something with URI because we just you see some spectacular performances from URI as well when they play against us. You know, they're much more emotional when they face UMass. They always want to beat us because they really look up to us, and I cannot blame them, you know. <laughs> um, tough day on Saturday to follow it up. Early game for the boys, 11 a.m. started. I missed it. I was sleeping. But uh, tough loss, 86-79 to Dayton, who has been a solid A-10 team this entire year. So not a bad loss. It's not like if they lost to URI. I mean, Dayton's a very, very solid squad. Yep. Um, Chris, what did you see in this game? Well, you know, we talked last week about how Dayton could, sh could shoot the three ball, and if UMass gave up a lot of threes, that this game would be a tougher game than it should be. And Dayton shot 9 of 20 from three-point land. So right off the bat there, you see, they were able to stay in the game. UMass stayed with them in the first half. I think they had a one-point lead, or it was a one-possession game going into the half. And then I think second half, Dayton just kind of came up with a little more fire and UMass was never quite able to rebound. They got down by, I think, like eight or nine there, and really that's, that's a tough hole to get out of when you're giving up threes and when you're on the road because, you know, the crowd isn't with you. You can't have that Mullen Center crowd there. Mm -hmm. uh, five Dayton players scored in, in double figures, so really everyone on Dayton was scoring. Again, Chaz, 17 points, five assists. Derek Gordon had uh, 15 points, six rebounds, and Trey Davis, again, off the bench, 19 points, three or four from three. I mean, he's been one of the best six men, I think, probably in the country mm -hmm. from a scoring standpoint. You can almost pencil him in for double figures every night. But I think at the end of the day, you know, we, we've seen it before in the A-10. If you don't play well 
the against any A-10 team, you have a chance to lose mm -hmm. because the A-10 is so competitive from top to bottom. Really, there's talent everywhere you look. And this was just a game where I think Dayton played better. UMass didn't have their best game, and they just lost. Yeah, it's like we've been saying all year. The A-10 is becoming one of the better conferences in the country for basketball. Definitely. And when you look at teams like VCU, UMass, St. Louis, even teams like George Washington at the top of the A-10, they're just really filling out, and it's becoming an entire conference thing where everybody's good and you're not going to be able to hang around if you're not playing good. Um, Mark, just some key points from Dayton you saw as well. Uh, well, one of the biggest areas of concern that we had to look to, um, Chaz Williams, I know he, he did finish with 17 points, but in the first half he only had two points, and he finished the day shooting five, from, five for 17 from the floor, which is just that's not going to win you a game. Mm -hmm. uh, even, I mean, d they were in it for most of the game against Dayton. Um, as Chris said, they did have five, Dayton did have five players in double digits. So it's not like, I mean, everyone's shooting. You can't just put your focus on one guy. Everyone's hitting the baskets and hitting the shots that they need to get. But one of the other things that um, I was really concerned about was the difference in assists. Uh, UMass only had six assists. Uh, Chaz Williams had five of them. Chaz is always, he's always getting the ball around. Yeah. But Dayton had 14. So they were just moving the ball around, and that was something we just couldn't control and we couldn't stop. So I think uh, going forward, as we go look into uh, the final two games of the season against Duquesne tomorrow night and against uh, St. Louis on Sunday, I just think uh, that's something we're going to have to be focused on going forward. Yeah, I think one of the positive things that they can take out of that date loss, and you really brought it up in that statement, is that uh, everything that they did bad is, is fixable. It's, yeah. it's yes. nothing that they played their best and just didn't beat Dayton. They, they know where they lost this game at different points, yeah. and they've played better than that all year. And, this, it's stuff they can go back and work on looking. I now. mean, they were right into it. When you look at it, 30 seconds left, they were down by three points. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't, yeah. you can't ask for much yeah, better. Exactly. Like, they were in it to the end. Especially uh, with a, a two-point ha first half from Chaz Williams yeah. to be in it at the end of the game. Yeah. That's very impressive. impressive. That is very impressive. Trey Davis off the bench, great game for him. That three-guard tandem continuing to step up, and that's going to continue to need to happen as we go into this final week of the regular season. UMass will take on Duquesne at Duquesne tomorrow night, and then on Sunday at 2 p.m., one of the biggest games of the year should rival the VCU game. They'll Absolutely. be taking on ranked St. Louis at the Mullen Center to finish off the regular season, and big momentum shift for one team going into the A-10 tournament. Sure. Now, a lot of people have been looking towards this St. Louis game because St. Louis has been ranked. They've been winning a lot. But we just saw them lose to Duquesne yep. after a 19-game win streak yep. uh, just, just last week. So Duquesne is no team to look past. So starting with that game tomorrow night, Mark, I'll start with you this time. Yep. What are some things this team needs to do to beat Duquesne at Duquesne? Well, the first thing they got to do is they can't, they, UMass cannot treat them with the George Mason treatment that they, where they kind of just overlooked them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we saw a couple weeks ago when we lost here at the Mullen Center to George Mason, um, the, which at the time was the worst team in the Atlantic 10. Um, Duquesne comes in right now. They're 12 and 15 overall, 4 and 10 in the conference, 10th uh, in the Atlantic 10. Um, so they really are going to have to put their focus. Um, two guys that really stuck out in the um, in Duquesne's win over St. Louis last week was uh, Micah Mason, who had 22 points. Um, he's a sophomore guard, and Jerry Jones, who had 19 points off the bench. So just like a lot of the other teams UMass has faced this season, two competitive guards that are going to be scoring a lot. So um, it's really going to mean Chaz is going to have to step up defensively. Derek Gordon, who's always been good for his, he's get known for his defense. And I think Trey Davis will help also, once again, have a big imp, uh, important part in, the, in tomorrow's night's game and then going into Sunday as well. Could see a very fast-paced game there at Duquesne. Chris, what do we need to do to win this going into St. Louis? Uh, I think the biggest thing is just to play tough. You know, you're on the road. It's going to be a midweek game, but you have to treat every game right now like mm -hmm. it's a huge game because in the A-10 standings, every win is crucial. The top four seeds get a double bye, which is going to be crucial because, you know, like we've seen, if you, play, if you have to play an extra game or two, you can get knocked out if you don't play well in the A-10. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, if you can get yourself, you know, make it easier now where you can. With the A-10 tournament coming up, you want that top four seed. This is the one that they should get. So uh, hopefully they can capitalize on a fairly easy game and get the easy one. Now, St. Louis, not going to be fairly easy, not going to be one that they should get. It's going to be one that they're going to have to work really hard to get, yeah. but definitely in reach, not something that's very crazy to think about. It's going to be a good game, going to be a competitive battle. For that game, what are some keys? Obviously, we're going to need Chaz to step up. Yeah. That's the given. But what are some other things you see that this UMass team needs to do to beat a very good Billikens team? 
Well, I think they have to play a full 40 minutes. You know, we've seen this team at times, whether it's at home or on the road, have a lap for three, laps for three or four minutes and kind of let, let the other team either, you know, get the advantage, get ahead in the game or get back into the game. I think UMass, it's crucial if they get off to a good start, you have to step on their throats. You can't let them back into the game. You have to kill them off. And it, it should happen. You know, everyone's going to be there at, you know, on Sunday, ESPN. It's already sold out. It's sold out, you know, within a day. So, I mean, this game's going to be crucial, but the biggest thing, I think, is just defense. You have to clean up the boards, limit the second-chance opportunities, and make the shots. You know, against VCU, they missed a lot of close-up shots. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, against St. Louis, the margin for error is even less. But I think they do have a chance to win. Every game the last two years that these two teams have played have been close. UMass won here two years ago. They lost at St. Louis last year. I see it going down to the final match and hopefully at home UMass can pull it out and get the big win against a ranked team. Yeah, definitely going to need a complete game out of the entire team. Would like to see a game like Dayton had multiple people in double digits. We've seen it before and be good yep. against a team like St. Louis. Mark, what do we need to do? Well, I think it's, you have to go in with the same, the same mindset you, that you went in with the VCU uh, a couple weeks ago. As Chris mentioned, we're gonna have, you're going to have the fans there. Give them a reason to get loud, get mm -hmm. excited for the game. Um, Caddy Lillian, I think, really needs to step up and have yes. a presence in the paint. Um, he just, over the last couple of games, um, he only had eight, eight rebounds the other day, which for a guy that's taller than everyone else on the court, uh, taller than all the opponents, he should be playing a lot better down low. Definitely. And uh, hopefully he can take advantage of the boards and hopefully uh, we'll pull out a win. Yeah, St. Louis, right. St. Louis is, a, is a very big team, so Caddy yeah. being our biggest guy, going to have to play some good basketball. We're in for a good game at the Mullins to finish up the regular season. That is at 2 p.m. again. We will be there. You should get there. But like I said, sold out. Got there quick. But uh, they're scalping already online. Oh, yeah. You can find your tickets. <laughs> Going to be a good one, guys. Thanks for joining me. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with men's and women's across. Welcome back to UMass Sports Weekly. Now joining me at the table to discuss men's and women's across. JMS, Jesse Mayfield, Sheehan, and the superhero himself, Jake Liberty. Guys, welcome to the table now. This is the kind of lacrosse segment we like talking about. This is what we're comfortable with. We're not overly excited because, like I said, we're comfortable. This is, this, is where we, this is where it should be. This is where it should remain. And it should only get better from here. Men's and women's, both number 10 in the country right now. We're not satisfied. We're comfortable. Good rankings, but should only go up from here. Big win for the men this past weekend, beating Brown 15-2. to two. Not even close. Not even close that's going to help their rankings as we go in to the future but jms why don't we talk a little bit about that game first well like you said definitely a big win for the men's lacrosse team especially after how they lost to brown last year by a heartbreaking score of nine to eight to beat them this handily a score of 15 to two and i think uh jake you were telling me just before this show that that was uh, a record breaking score or not a record breaking but uh the lowest amount of goals they have allowed in a game since i think you said 2001 yeah, one. that is an impressive defensive Very. performance a great game in uh, net by uh, sophomore goalkeeper zach oliveri he finished with 10 saves on the day playing for most of the game so that was a great performance for him. He's been doing great in net so far this mm -hmm. season. And really just a great all-around performance from the team. Of course, freshman standout Nick Mariano had another great game offensively. I believe he finished with five goals to lead the team once again. He's been outstanding so far. He's been just what this team has needed mm -hmm. after losing two of its greatest offensive weapons. You know, it's like when a puzzle, you lose a corner piece, and then all of a sudden you just find it under the rug. It's like exactly what the team needed. It needed that offensive go-to player, and they just found it right away with Nick Mariano. So everything seems to be coming together for the team right now. And like I said, after losing to Brown last year, that loss that started that tough four-game losing streak for them, you know, after having that, to come out and beat Brown like this, mm -hmm. huge, huge win for the team. Yeah, I've been really impressed with Mariano, and it seems like he does not mind the pressure of putting the offensive workload on his back at all. And that's, that's good for the future. We're going to keep a lot of pressure on him here as UMass fans. He's doing good early. Apply pressure now, and hopefully he just keeps, keeps getting better. Uh, Jake, what did you see in this game? You know, they're 4-0 currently. They've been 4-0 12 times in their uh, past few years. The past four years, they've been 4-0 three times. Now, you know, that's a very good start. However, the past few years haven't been exactly what, you know, we're used to for UMass uh, mm -hmm. men's lacrosse. Um, you know, last year they started off 3-0, ended up losing to Brown, like JMS said. And, you know, it's just, it's, it wasn't the season they were looking for. 
So you can never get, you know, as I was telling JMS, my football coach would always say, you can't get fat and lazy. I'm going to tell them the same thing, can't get fat and lazy here. you got to keep the pressure on. you got to keep scoring. you got to keep winning games. You can't say, oh, we're 4-0. You know, you can't settle. You can never settle. Uh, number 10 in the nation, it's not number one. Mm -hmm. It's not, not even exactly. close to number one. So you got to keep going. Got a lot of good teams ahead of them that they can uh, definitely uh, win and prove themselves even more. I think they're having a better, much better season even in these four games than last season all around. Um, like you said, freshman Nick Mariano came in. He's absolutely killing it. He's leading the team with 15 points, 14 goals, one assist. Um, Oliveri won Athlete of the Week. Um, you know, you're looking at just a solid team this year. Mm -hmm. um, and I definitely see a lot of potential for uh, the rest of the season. Like I said, though, they can't settle. Yeah, they got their heavy offensive impact is there. Strong goaltending is there. And only 12 shots against Brown, just two goals. Obviously, their defense is very much there as well. So all the tangibles are there. They have the makings of a great team. And obviously, they are very good right now, number 10 in the country. But like you said, they are not number one. We are not satisfied. And I think we will continue to see them decline. But it will rely a lot on Nick Mariano's performance. If he falls off, it could be very detrimental for this team. But I don't think that's going to happen because I have a lot of faith in the kid. I think it's going to be a good season for these Minutemen on the lacrosse field. Over to the Minute Women, same good news for them. Also number 10 in the country. Just got finished beating BU 11-8. to Really good game there. JMS was actually in the house for the game. And we have some highlights for him. JMS, why don't you tell us about the game? All right, well, Casey, you know, very hard-fought victory for the Minute Women here against Boston University on Wednesday afternoon. Terriers gave the Minute Women some trouble early on, taking a 3-1 lead eight minutes in on this goal by Mallory Collins. Then, just a few minutes later, UMass got started on its comeback. First, it's Sam Rush from the free position. Bam, right there. Then Erica Ipe coming around the corner. Bam. Then Katie Ferris over to Ipe. Bam. And then Ferris to Ipe again. Bam. A 4 nothing run, and the Minute Women go up 5-3. to three. But then the Terrier's not done yet. Jenna Borman scores with a minute left in the half, brings BU within one. And with that, we go to the second half. Um, just a minute in, and it's Kelsey Marafiotti who scores and ties the game up for the Terriers. But the tie was short-lived, though. Just a couple minutes later, and Tanner Guarino breaks the tie with this free position goal. And then the Minute Women take off again. Kelsey Sheridan, bam. To Guarino to rush, bam. Katie Ferris, bam. Another 4 nothing run for UMass, and they take a 9-5 to lead. That essentially puts the game away, and they go on to defeat the Terrors by a final score, as you said, of 11-8. to Well, JMS, that is a very strong performance from those Minute Women, bamming everywhere, all over the place, all over the Terriers. Some very strong goals, even stronger highlight read, I gotta say. I mean, that, the game, those games can get pretty boring, but when you got JMS voicing over them, that's some, there's some excitement there. Um, so, good win over BU. We saw the, the four straight goals was really good for them. Uh, really strong play. You need stretches like that if you want to win games in lacrosse. What were some positives you took out of this game? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like you said, those uh, four nothing runs, definitely huge. You're always going to see strong offensive performances from the Minute Women. That's just how they play. They're an offensive style team, so you're always going to see big outputs. If you see a performance where they put out less than 10 goals, something's wrong or they're playing a very strong defensive team. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what I, what I saw, you know, when they went down 3-1 to one early on, you know, I was like, well, goodness, this is not, the, this is not how the Minute Women usually play. The, you know, BU was giving them real trouble. You know, they were playing very well defensively, the Terriers were, and their, uh, their goaltender was making some really great saves. BU was playing very well defensively. And they were, like I said, they were giving UMass some really good, big trouble early on. But when they were able to bounce back, go on that first 4 nothing run, and really turn the game around, that just showed that when they're faced with some adversity like that, that they are able to turn things around and face up to that, that they're not just a team who you know, just can dominate easy opponents, who just take those easy wins where they just completely run over their opponents. They're a team that can face up to you know, a close game or an early deficit mm -hmm. and can take those wins as well. I mean, we've seen that in the past, so we know this is a team that can handle t the tough wins, the close wins like this one, just by three goals, as well as the wins like they got over the weekend uh, on the road against Iona by a score of 19-6. to So they can take the games that aren't even close, and they can take the ones that are close as well. And also what I liked in this game 
I mentioned her name quite a few times in that first uh, comeback run, Erica Eip. Uh, she scored four goals in this game, her first four goals of the season, and then followed that up with three more goals against Iona. So she's becoming a real offensive presence for this team. She's only a sophomore, and that's really something that this team is going to need uh, down the road as a number of their uh, key players right now are seniors. So they're going to be losing a number of offensive threats down the road, and having a player stepping up like Erica Ipe is really just only adds to the offensive presence right now and is going to be so huge for them going forward. So to quote Jake's football coach, this team is not getting fat and lazy right now. No. <laughs> They're performing in every game, and it doesn't matter the competition. And it's good to see, again, like Nick Mariano, it's good to see that offensive production coming from unexpected places, especially for the Minute Woman. Strong win there over BU. Jake, what did you see in this game? Tough act to fall there, but what did you see? You know, nothing new here. It's <laughs> women's lacrosse, it's always, you know, they're always doing good past seasons. Mm -hmm. Very consistent, um, just always dominating the field. Uh, uh, they're 5-0 and right now. You know, like he said, against BU, that was a huge game. They went... Uh, the past four meets against BU were split, uh, two wins by UMass, two wins by BU. This was a big game, and we ended up, you know, after that, uh, uh, after BU was leading, we ended up coming back and really showing, you know, who the Minute Women are. Um, like he said about adversity, really backs against the wall. How are you going to show it? And they, you know, performed very well. Iona, 19-6 to win, no problems there. You had 12 different Minute Women score in that mm -hmm. game. 12. That's insane. Yeah. One of the biggest facts to focus on about that game was they outshot Iona 39 to 11. 39 to 11. That's not even close on offense. You know, like JMS said, you know, they're always an offensive team. 39 to 11, you know, that's, that's just unheard of. Impressive. Unless you're the minute women. Yeah. Domination, you know, that's, that's what we like to see. And we want to see it for the remainder of the year, including coming up on this Saturday. The minute women will be taking on UNH at home. Also on Saturday, the men, men playing at home. A little discrepancy there, but they're on two different fields, if, if I'm not mistaken. It's a little law. JMS isn't a big fan, but that's for another day. Uh, men and men will be taking on Albany at Garber Field on Saturday. So some good lacrosse action here in Amherst coming Saturday. Quick preview for those games. JMS, what do the men have to do against Albany? Well, uh, you know, it's like we've been saying this whole segment. Do not get fat and lazy. <laughs> You know, Albany is ranked number 17, so even though the Minutemen are ranked 10th, they cannot take these guys lightly. You know, we, I talked about how they lost to Brown um, by a score of 9-8 to last year and then went on a tough four-game losing streak after the team started 3-0. and Part of that losing streak was a tough loss to Albany. You know, that was the loss right after Brown. So Albany is a team that has to be taken seriously. You know, they can't go on, they can't be starting a slippery slope. They cannot start losing now. You know, this team has been going strong. The defense has looked really good so far. Only allow, oh, they've allowed five or less goals in three of their four games so far. Um, but that last game was against a ranked team. It was against Ohio State. So now that they're starting to play some of their tougher opponents, they're starting to play a ranked team like Albany, they really have to make sure that they can step up, have to make sure they can step up not just defensively but offensively against you know, a more productive team like Albany. Make sure guys like Mariano keep performing mm -hmm. and make sure some of the other guys can step up you know, alongside Mariano and provide some more offensive production. You know, make sure Mariano isn't always yeah. the guy that has to save the day because it's a team effort, yeah. obviously. So I think that's what you really have to see in a game against Albany. So hopefully we see some other players staying, stepping up for this Minutemen team, especially like a team, against a team like Albany and at home. Good situation for some other guys to try to get some shine. Now, Jake, you've been exuding confidence on this women's team all year. Is this UNH game just another game? they gotta, they got to go in there and just play how they play and they'll be all right, or they, they got to expect some competition? Uh, you know... If they, you know, like I said, if they settle, they're going to get competition mm -hmm. for the competition that they need. UNH, not an unbelievable team, but a good team. Enough to, you know, give them some trouble if they let it happen. So I don't see the minute women settling. If you look the past few seasons, mm -hmm. they've never just, you know, gotten ahead and then just given up. They've always kept the pressure on. And I think that's what you really need. Um, I think it's just another game that if they play how they've been playing the past you know, several seasons, shouldn't be any problems. Should be an easy win. So hopefully this strong performance from both the Minutemen and the Minute Woman continues on the lacrosse field. Some good games Saturday to see that performance keep going. And we'll be keeping an eye on them for the rest of the spring. Guys, good stuff. Appreciate it. Stay tuned and we'll be right back with the Sports Desk with Tim Dennehy. Bam. 
Good evening, UMass. I'm Tim Denny, and welcome to your Boston Sports Desk, the only place where LeBron and his nose will not be the topic of conversation. The Red Sox started spring training this past week, defending their World Series championship. Unfortunately, they're off to a one and four start, but hey, cut them some slack. They're still getting used to that harsh Florida weather. Switching over to hockey, the Bruins have lost two out of their last three games since the NHL resumed from the Sochi Olympics. However, they did beat the New York Rangers last Sunday by an impressive margin of 6-3. to three. The Bees play again tonight against Tim Thomas and the Florida Panthers, who just recently traded and received Vancouver goalie Roberto Luongo. However, as of now, Tim Thomas will get the start in his old crease in Boston. Trade rumors are fluttering around the TD Garden as the NHL trade deadline approaches. Bruins' top scout was recently cited in Columbus to watch the Blue Jackets as some possible forward prospects. I'd keep an eye out as you never know what's up Coach Julian's sleeve. The Celtics continue their downward trend, losing six out of the last seven games, including a game on February 22nd against the Kings, where Rajon Rondo decided to take upon himself to skip the game to celebrate his own birthday. Thank you very much, Captain. Boston's very happy that you had a good birthday. That's going to do it for me. We're going to keep it short on the UMass Sports Tech. Stay tuned as Natalie Sibleski and Demi Foley caught up with the nine graduating UMass hockey seniors in an exclusive interview. I'm Tim Denny, and this was your Boston Sports Desk. You know, I'm going to miss everything, but I think the uh, thing I'm going to miss the most is probably the, the fans at UMass. Um, I remember my first game, it was... Uh, it was at uh, it was here. Uh, we were playing Boston University. It was just it was packed. It was like it was overwhelming for me because I didn't I've never really had fans like that. So they're so into the game and they're like they're like the sixth man on the ice for us. It was just uh, it's incredible. You know they support us and they're always there. So definitely the fans. Uh, I think it'd for sure be the fans. There's nothing better than coming uh, to the rink on a Friday or Saturday night, playing in front of a packed Mullen Center with all your students. Uh, I think it's for sure probably one of the best places to play in the country especially when we're playing a team like Boston College, Boston University. You know, I feel like our fans are always pumped up for those games, and there's nothing better than that on a Friday or Saturday night. Uh, probably just uh, coming down to the rink and getting ready for a Friday or Saturday night game. Um, I'd say the fans, obviously, were unbelievable in my past four years, and um, off the ice just uh, getting to know so many you know, great people around the area and community. And obviously the 25 other guys in here, and you know the people that came before me too, they've uh, last or they put a lasting impression on me, and uh, they've definitely changed me for the better, and I've learned a lot about myself. So it was good. Uh, for me personally, I'm gonna miss uh, my teammates. Uh, you know they're they've been with me through everything, and you know I'm with them every single day. Um, so it's gonna be kind of hard not to miss them, and uh, you know they're just such great guys and. Uh, I love them, so I'm going to miss them the most, probably. Uh, probably just coming to the rink every day and seeing all the guys on the team, talking, telling stories about the weekend, or just hanging out, telling stories about class, stuff like that. Probably miss that the most, just seeing all the guys. Uh, I just got to say, coming to the rink every day. Um, had a lot of fun memories, you know, with the guys in the locker room. Um, it always brightens my day, coming in, seeing the guys' faces, and, uh, you know, laughing and joking around. So uh, yeah. that would probably be one of the things that I miss the most. Uh, there's a lot of different things that were fun and exciting here at UMass, but I'd have to say our Florida tournament uh, my sophomore year, you know, getting to go to Florida with your team and, you know, one day you're on the beach and the next day you're you're playing hockey. So I'd have to say that was a, a really cool memory. Uh, well, I have to say, first and foremost, uh, playing in front of home crowd at the Mullen Center. Uh, when our students come out and they uh, pack the Mullins, it's really fun to play in and it's a fun environment for everyone. Uh, other than that, though, I'd just say all the boys, uh, away from the rink, it's just you have a lot of downtime, and uh, especially over winter break and stuff, it's just all hanging out with the boys, and and you have nothing to do but to see them. So uh, if we didn't have a great group of guys, I, I wouldn't have missed it so much, but uh, I like all of them. So. I'm going to miss all the all my teammates, uh, hanging out with them every day, you know, before and after practice. Um, also, we miss all the fans, a uh, great crowd every game, and uh, just going to miss being a part of uh, UMass. They're all good dining halls. Uh, 
definitely my favorite is probably the Burke. Um, you know, it's great food, good in, good environment, good atmosphere. Um, you know, I think I like the stir fry there. Uh, you know, I get stir fry a lot. Um, so probably probably the Burke is my favorite. I'd have to go with uh, with Burke. You know, it's uh, the most exciting because there's always something going on, and you know, for me, it's not really the food there, but more so the atmosphere and just being a college student in that dining hall is a, a lot of fun and gets to meet a lot of people. Um, but I have to say that I like Burke. Uh, it's in Southwest. It's just a great atmosphere. Um, you know, all the people from the Southwest go and definitely has a lot of girls in there, so that's always an upside. But um, yeah, I would definitely say Burke. Ah, it's a good question for me because I love Antonio's. Um, I'm going to have to go with the uh, bacon chicken ranch, uh, Sicilian preferable, but I'm not picky. Um, other than that, I mean, you can never go wrong with the hot cheese up front for a dollar. Oh. So, yeah, I'd have to say those two right there. <laughs> Tough okay. one. I'd for sure say probably chicken bacon ranch. Uh, it's probably my favorite, but like Anthony said earlier, you can't go wrong with the hot cheese up front. It was pretty special. I had a lot of family there. My sister even surprised me from Maryland, so that was nice to see her. And she was there, and I finally scored this year. It's been kind of hard. I haven't scored a goal yet, so it's nice to get it on senior night. And I have a bunch of family there too, which made it extra special. I would say just uh, enjoy the ride. And uh, four years goes by quick. I know everyone's, you know, kind of told me that as as I approach college and throughout my years here, but it does, and uh, you, you can only control what, you know, what you can control, so uh, whether it be practicing harder or, you know, doing little things or making sure you take care of your body in a certain, you know, time frame, it's, it's unbelievable. It's an unbelievable experience, so enjoy it and, uh, you know, make every day count. Yeah, I just say uh, enjoy your time here. Uh, it flies by and I remember the seniors telling me when I came in as a freshman that's going to fly by and you're going to miss it once it's gone, but you don't realize it until, I mean, we played our last game this uh, Saturday and you don't really realize it until then. And um, just have fun on campus, do everything you can, go to sporting events, do everything you can to be involved on campus and just have a good time. You know, when I came in, uh, the seniors told me that it goes by fast, so I really enjoy it. And uh, you really never truly understand that until, you know, I am where I am now. So. Uh, these four years have gone by so fast and we've just had so much fun that uh, you know you really got to take advantage of every moment and just enjoy your time here. Welcome back to UMass Sports Weekly. Now join me at the table to discuss the rest of UMass athletics. Demi Foley and Mark Jean Louis, lady and gent, welcome to the table. Now, this is a very, uh, this is a very negative, uneventful segment. Uh, we're kind of just we're gonna we're gonna put it in there. Hopefully, that the teams will see this and get some encouragement uh, because there's not much not much positive to talk about. We're gonna start it off uh, with women's hoops, who has had a very forgettable season. Um, struggled in the A10. They're sitting at the bottom of the A10, but for women's Basketball, A-10 playoffs, every team makes it. But the 12 and 13 seeds will first play in a play-in game to continue. It's considered the first round of the A-10 tournament. It's 12 versus 13. It's kind of stupid. But they're trying to avoid that play-in game and be the 11th seed, which gets them right into the second round of the tournament, which is every other team but 12 and 13. A little confusing, but I th th they'll figure it out. But the big game for this woman hoops team is coming against George Mason tomorrow at George Mason. Now, Mark, what does this team have to do to beat George Mason as they're going into this A-10 playoffs and trying to avoid this game? As you said in your introduction, it's really ironic now that there are 13 teams in the Atlantic 10. You have the 12 team and the 13 team going in this one, team, one game playoff. And who's the team that UMass facing in this playoff game? The team that just most recently joined the Atlantic 10 Cowards and George Mason. Who would have thought? <laughs> but the last time um, UMass and George Mason went off to face against each other, it was not a good result for the men and women. They lost in this one very, very badly. Let me just say this again one more time. Very badly. I can't stress that hard enough. They lost this one 
101 to 73. Now scoring 100 points in a women's basketball game, that's already just absolutely absurd enough as it is. But in this game, UMass, they did not look impressive from the field. They shot about 41% from the field. And again, not even very good from the free throw line either. They missed a lot of their free throw shots, but still shot up a somewhat respectable 59% from this team. In this game, four GMU stars, sorry, three GMU stars, they scored over 20 points in this game, and another one scored 15 points in this game. At halftime, it was a very close game. I think UMass was just down 45-36, but in the second half, that's when GMU just absolutely took off, scoring 56 points in the second half in this one. And so to answer your question, Casey, uh, I think what UMass needs to do in order to have a chance in this game is definitely um, just make a presence on the defensive boards when it comes to their two big, their two big women, sorry, two big women, uh, Kim Pierre-Lewis and Rashida Tambilla. They're both leading the team in rebounds, around seven, around seven rebounds a game each. And so what they need to do is, UMass is a team that doesn't score a lot of points offensively. They average around 62 points a game. But also George Mason is very similar to UMass in that regards. George Mason scores about 63, 64 points a game. So not a lot of offense going on here. So what we need from these two big women is that if they can just like grab down their reboards, rebounds, sorry, verbal gaff, <laughs> and um, yes, just make a huge force on the defensive presence, make sure to get their block shots in, and make sure that GMU doesn't have a lot of time to possess the ball. Even if they don't score a ton of points in this one, it at least gives you a massive chance. Yeah, Tambilla and Pierre-Louis are really the only two women on the team that have some rebounding capabilities. It's a pretty small team, not a very aggressive team, so big game out of them is pretty much always necessary for this team if they want to win. It's going to be very necessary against a good George Mason team tomorrow. On to hockey now, a, another very forgettable season. The Minutemen are sitting at the bottom of the Hockey East as we're getting ready for the Hockey East playoffs. And not a lot of good feelings about this team right now around here going into this tournament. As we know, Hockey East is the best hockey division in the country by far with plenty of ranked teams. So the playoffs are unbelievably competitive. Damn it, we know this team has not had the success that we would have liked it to have. So going into this Hockey East tournament, what, what can they do to salvage some positivity and make some good happen going into this tournament against some very, very good competition? You know, Casey, there's a lot of things that they, that they should do, but based on how, what we've seen out of the team throughout the season, I'm not sure if they will do it. They are sitting at the bottom at number 10, right above Merrimack, so it isn't the worst it could be. Tonight, 7.05 in Vermont, we're facing against the Catamounts, ranked number 7 in Hockey East right now. So the last two times we saw this team, they came out with the win, 3-2 and 2-0. So it makes me think there definitely is a chance. We, uh, Frank Fashano is going to take the ice. There's some buzz around his career premiere, so to speak, with UMass. He's a redshirted freshman. Something happened due to the NCAA double transfer rules, and he transferred over from BC, so this will be the first game. Hopefully that can sort of ignite some excitement among the Minutemen. You know, the nine seniors, they want to end their season on a high note, not at the bottom of Hockey East, also getting, also losing in the single elimination round. Mm. Hopefully, you know, they can salvage the loss that they had against the Friars at home on senior night. Maybe Frank can, you know, put some oomph into this team. What really I think it comes down to is they just, they need to shoot more. They need to score more. What's happened is they're facing these teams at the top of the Hockey East and they're being outshot. If you're at the bottom of the pack, you can't, on top of that, be outshot. Mm -hmm. On top of that, look slow. And on top of that, not finish plays. Mm -hmm. You're just going in with no hope. So I'm hoping that maybe, you know, with all the nine seniors, the new player on the ice, that they'll have some, you know, some heart. That's what it's honestly going to take. I don't want to put it just on the goaltending. I don't want to put it just on the coaching or just mm -hmm. on the lack of skill. But right now, they're just not a team that's able to contend with the top talent of the Hockey East. Um, and it's sort of like maybe walking into a death trap if we do win on Friday night, which I hope we do. We're facing UMass Lowell, who has beaten us and blown us out for the three times they faced us this season, and that will take place on Saturday if we do move on. So we're hoping for the best, but if we just go with the track record of the season, they're definitely going in as the underdog. So we're going to need a lot more aggressive play out of this team that really we haven't seen all year from them, as you're saying, lacking in shots, really lacking in offense against some offensive powerhouses. So just an aggressive overall game from this an team. An aggressive overall game, and they need to stay out of the box. We've had a couple games where we've had the leading scorer, Mike Perry, in the box for you know numerous mm -hmm. times. You have your top line going in the box. It just can't happen. We, as it is 
need to be bringing our top game with every single top player on the ice all the time. We can't be shorthanded on top of the fact that we're just not as skilled as some of the other teams out there. So I think the best thing that they can do is just stack the odds in their favor, play an aggressive yet clean game, stay on the ice, and outshoot the other team. The only way they're going to score is if they shoot mm -hmm. and finish the play, which mm -hmm. we've been struggling with yeah. both of those things yeah. lately. But definitely hoping for the best. That's going to take place on Friday and um, be aired by Nesson at 7.05 against the Catamount. So keep you guys posted on that. So we need smart hockey. Smart hockey. Aggressive hockey. And stay out of the – get your goal scorers out of the box. That's just common sense. That's When you have some of your goal scorers in the box, that is just a uh, – you know, uh, fo foolish mistake by whoever that goal scorer may be. Like, except if you guys Pereira. are listening, stay out of the yeah, box. Stay out of the box. Stay out of the box and try it out. Bring some not, joy to the minute fans. Not going to score on the ice. Finish your career strong. Don't finish it in the box. <laughs> But uh, we'll see how it plays out. Hopefully, we can get a win for this team. Yeah, absolutely. And if I can just um, yeah. add on before we sign off really quick. I mean, these last five games for UMass, I mean, it hasn't been going well for UMass. They've lost five in a row now. But mm -hmm. if you look at four of their last five games, they've actually come very close to winning some of them. They've actually lost four of their last five games by just one goal. And so now that we're going into this playoff game against um, UVM, just looking at their last series against UVM, I just did some statistics over here. In the first game at UMass where they lost 3-2, um, very close game, they were outshot 29-23 and went 0-2 on the power play. And then in the second game against UVM, over at UVM that time, they, were, um, they actually outshot UVM in that game 39-34, but then again, no goals, and again, 0-2 on the power play. So in this one, I think the key for UMass in this one is you have to give Steve Maslow the chance. Mm -hmm. Can't have him do all the work on defense to you know, keep UMass in this one. If they can get some goals and you know, like try to add to their goals total by scoring the power play, it will really go a long way for this team. Yeah, the one-goal losses have been really, really tough on this team. And I think that would be the worst-case scenario for this team is to lose by one goal again on the final game of the season. I hate to say it, but I'd rather see him lose by two or three goals than to make it another game, just barely not getting there. But I think this game will make it happen. Like you said, four of the five losses have been by one goal. you got to learn something from those yeah, games. Yeah, I think that's just like a perfect example of how they're not able to finish, how they're not able to close the gap, like we were saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, even last Friday against the Friars, they came back from a three-goal deficit, and then right at the end, the Friars scored. And that's what happens when you're playing the top contenders in Hockey East. They don't let you come back all the way. Exactly. You can so only that's where we're coming into this huge problem of not being able to finish, of only missing it by one goal. We're not a bad team. We're a solid team. We're just not there yet to compete with the top contenders. So that's where I think the mm -hmm. heart's going to come into play. Fr Frank Ricciano pulling out crazy plays, hopefully. It's all hopefully matter just, listening too. It's all a matter of just taking advantage of every, single of every single opportunity. Again, I mean, take a look at UMass, for example. If they had just maybe like, converted on some of those power play goals, we might be talking mm -hmm. a whole different story right here. Absolutely. So hopefully they can salvage some of this very disappointing and rough season in these upcoming games. Nine seniors on the team. Don't want to see them go out on a very negative note, but it has been that way, but they still have a chance to salvage some positivity, and hopefully we see some good coming out of these next two games. Guys, thanks for joining me at the table. As always, we thank you at home for watching. Make sure to check us out on Facebook, UMass Sports Weekly. Give us a like. There you can check out all our full episodes and segments. Also, check us out on Twitter and Instagram at UM Sports Weekly. Your number one for UMass men's basketball coverage will be at Sunday's game with plenty of coverage for you there. Be sure to tune in to our Twitter. And as always, we'll be back here next week, same time, same place. Have a good weekend, UMass.